Hello, everybody. I'm Ron Waxman. We are in uh, the COVID-19 series uh, at CRT Online, and I have a special guest, uh, David Capodano, uh, who are, is the new editor-in-chief of your intervention. He's also uh, work in uh, Catania in Italy. Welcome. Hello, Ron. Thank you for having me. And first, I'd like to congratulate you on the new position as the editor-in-chief of your intervention. So. Um, if you can tell us when this was happened and uh, uh, how do you view the journal uh, and what's your plans for the journal in the, the new role that you have? Yeah, thank you. The, the role became effective uh, in January. So it's only a few months that I started this uh, endeavor. And of course, uh, as uh, everyone knows, uh, this was uh, uh, the previous task of uh, Professor Patrick Soroy that uh, led this journal to its uh, current position and led the journal for 15 years. So as you can imagine, it's really uh, difficult and uh, quite uh, impressive that I have this task up, uh, after such important uh, icon in the field of uh, interventional cardiology. But I think the spirit was, of course, uh, that of uh, transition continuity, but also um, we want to bring the journal to uh, the new uh, decade somehow and, of course, uh, try to uh, move forward with the development of the printed pages and the online version. Yeah, and, and you represent really uh, a new generation in the field of interventional cardiology, vision, uh, more into the digital age, and uh, a lot of things that comes with, uh, I don't know which millennium you consider yourself, but obviously there is definitely a new spirit and a new wave. Um, so the question is, how do you materialize that? Because I think everybody knows there is a competition, there is many... There are many journals, uh, also internationally and also uh, here in the U.S. So uh, what is that you need to do to differentiate the journal from the other journals to keep uh, to be really in the top leading uh, journals for interventional cardiology? Yes, yeah, you can imagine I reflected on that uh, when I set the, uh, the position because, of course, uh, there is a lot of competition and uh, the other journals are excellent in my mind. So when I uh, look, uh, we can say, of course, uh, the Jack intervention, Silk intervention, uh, uh, catheterization, cardiovascular intervention, your journal also, uh, I think uh, there is such a variety of uh, different uh, flavors there that... Uh, uh, maybe the, the wise thing to do is just to concentrate on what makes uh, your intervention uh, somehow, I would not say unique, but uh, uh, important to its audience. And if I think of your intervention, it's really the journal of uh, innovation. It's the journal of uh, uh, a community of uh, practicing physicians that want to see uh, a kind of blend between uh, science, but also practical things, like in the uh, PCR spirit somehow. So, of course, I want to continue to push on, on that direction, but at the same time, I would like also to um, enhance the scientific aspect of the uh, journal, which I think is something we can uh, work on. Of course, uh, very important papers have been published over the years, but our ambition is that we attract even more in the future. And of course, uh, as I said, the competition is important. People uh, would like to reach uh, uh, journals with higher impact factor, but at the same time, we would like to give them the temptation to uh, uh, have, uh, yes, to be not really well decided to go in one direction. They have also the new intervention option. And you have a very um, interactive uh, website for the journal that actually people can go and I advise everybody to see this is not just another website for a journal. It's a basically a very good resource for information. Um, and in uh, what you know is uh, most of the people who read the journal or look into the journal, are they doing it over the web or are they doing it uh, through the actually printed uh, issues? Yeah, that's a very good point because PCR online is uh, established at least in the PCR uh, community and has a lot of visits, a lot of uh, downloads, etc. So it would be uh, um, stupid not to maximize and leverage on uh, that opportunity also with the journal. And I think uh, we have to work to even enhance these uh, synergies. What I can tell you is that we have uh, very uh, different readers of the website and, and the journal somehow, because uh, I have the feeling that uh, the doctor who really wants uh, 
uh, tips, tricks, uh, practice, uh, tools, techniques, etc., goes to the website. And uh, that is where I see really this kind of practical uh, um, topics that are really the core of uh, your intervention somehow. What I would like to have in the journal more uh, the scientific part, which is uh, I would say not, uh, not only for the academicians, but also for the practicing physicians, because we should not uh, lose sight of the translation in practice of uh, all the uh, science that we uh, provide. But I say, at the same time, if uh, you ask me uh, where I see the future, that's really, I think all the practical things will go more online because you have more uh, possibility to be visual with the videos, with the uh, uh, pictures, etc. While in print, uh, I would see more the, uh, uh, the, the science Science, let's say the expert consensus documents, the state of the art reviews, etc. So, of course, this will be complementary. We have a strong presence on the web because uh, if you ask me about my uh, impact factor, the current one, uh, I'm not, uh, yeah, let's say we can improve. But if you ask me about the alt metric, which is now a, a metric, a measure of uh, the impact beyond the printed pages on the web, et cetera, et cetera, your intervention stands in a good position. So we have also to, uh, to understand that there is something beyond the impact factor and we can also uh, leverage on that. Yeah, and you mentioned a couple of times the impact factor, which uh, still we cannot ignore it. And there is like a, uh, maybe um, stealth competition about everybody looking on an impact factor when you submit a paper and in between the journals, uh, even though a lot of criticism about it. Uh, but one of the issues that it does bring you uh, when you get interesting case reports or very nice illustration uh, that may not be counted as a citable um, material, which can impact on the impact factor. You kind of struggling, uh, should I publish it or not publish it? I know that some journal says, we're gonna put the case report uh, no matter what, and that's CCI, and they say we ignore, uh, even though it's gonna affect our impact factor. Some journals have a specific issue now for case report. I think uh, European Heart Journal, Jack, and, uh, Jack as a case report, uh, um, we do all the, in our journal, um, we do one issue here for all the selected case reports, but what the approach that your intervention take with those case reports right now? Yeah, basically this started some years ago and I confirmed this uh, uh, position of the journal, uh, uh, which is uh, that of not accepting case reports. Because, uh, yeah, the, this is something interesting, but that uh, in our uh, mind can go uh, directly to PCR online. So if people are interested in the dissemination of the case, this is not a problem. Of course, if they want the case, and this is understandable, to be indexed, uh, yes, uh, your intervention is not uh, the place to go for that. However, we have a section which is called Interventional Flashlights, in which uh, we host uh, uh, pictures, essentially, with the caption of only 400 words. So something which is striking and uh, is a message that can be eventually shared with the community about uh, a new uh, physiopathology thing or uh, a new device, a new tool, uh, a new strategy. So whenever there is something striking, which is not necessarily uh, linked to a case, but uh, to a new technique or whatever, this is the section in which we still uh, host this kind of information. It's uh, uh, something that uh, it's, uh, as, as you said, not counted in the impact factor because of course this is technical and you know very well that there are some items that are not uh, affecting the denominator but can positively uh, impact on the uh, numerator of the impact factor. But at the same time, yes, uh, uh, as you say, uh, it's important that the uh, journal is a pleasant reading. So sometimes when you have uh, uh, something interesting, you really don't ask yourself if the impact factor will be affected or not. You just publish, you follow your instinct, and of course the peer review uh, process, and uh, in the end, we want people that are attracted to the science, but also are attracted by the journal as a whole. So we want people to be happy when they uh, turn the pages of your intervention or consult it online. And so uh, I, I would reply that, yes, we concentrate more on the merit of the article rather than thinking too much about the chemistry of the impact factor, which is important anyway. Thank you. And uh, we have obviously living in the era of the COVID-19 uh, and I want to know how this is impact the uh, type of submissions that you get, the number of submission. So the whole era, if you look on the month of March and April, 
uh, what did you see different? Did you see more or less submissions? Did you see uh, influx of COVID-19 uh, submissions, more case report? And how do you manage to decide which one is uh, gonna be come to print uh, in this specific era? So let's say, uh, statistically speaking, the number of submissions, I think this is common for uh, all the other editors, uh, has uh, simply doubled. So uh, the number of papers that we received in April is uh, exactly uh, doubled as compared with April 2019. So yes, uh, this is of course a challenge for uh, all the system, for the offices, uh, for uh, the reviewers, uh, of course, as you can imagine. It's true that uh, the number of papers has increased because people have more time to write, I think, and reviewers have also more time to review. That's also uh, good. So in this moment, I don't, I would not say that we are suffering uh, of delays or something like that. We are uh, on track because, uh, and I, I have really to thank all the people that work with the journal, including you, of course, uh, uh, Ron, that uh, give us a lot of help as a senior uh, uh, consultant um, and reviewer as well. So uh, yes, uh, the number of papers has increased, but I would not say that we received much more uh, proportionally in terms of COVID submission because we have received uh, uh, quite a few, but I would say that since the very beginning, the idea were quite clear on what we wanted to consider and what we didn't want. So in other words, at the very beginning, like in uh, March, uh, we received a lot of, uh, I, I would call them uh, protocol papers, checklists, uh, how to do, uh, how to wear uh, scrub and scrub, uh, how to wear all the protection devices, etc. Um, there were papers about how to organize the, uh, the workload in the uh, COVID centers, etc. So actually, because we have PCR online, we uh, informed the uh, authors of the submissions that the idea was to uh, allow for a wide dissemination of this material, which is important, to, uh, through PCR online, while we would keep the journal for the scientific submissions, so papers, uh, science, uh, and for expert consensus documents from international uh, uh, societies. So this was the strategy since the beginning. Of course, uh, uh, many were disappointed, but uh, it's a vision that we have. And the reason is that uh, uh, the problem with this submission, uh, in my mind, is that they can become rapidly obsolete. Because of course, you give a message uh, in March, which is important, but when uh, you will be able to print, uh, which uh, may be in July, August, then it's not so important. So I think the web is the way to disseminate this information and the printed pages are for the papers that are here to stay. Yeah, I know I concur with uh, this approach. I think it's a very smart and practical one. As a matter of fact, um, again, if I can share with you my thoughts about it, um, both I think uh, your intervention and also the CRM journal have something in common. We have a large meeting that we are associated with. I mean, obviously your intervention is connected to your PCR and we do have a strong website um, that support, I mean, PCR online and uh, CRT online. So that gives us some advantage maybe over other journals that don't have these uh, uh, options. And the way that I view it is the following. If you really want to disseminate your work and your reporting, you can achieve it by getting the information posted on a PCR online or on the Euro Intervention website and that would give you maybe the fame, the contribution, uh, very, very short, uh, very, very close to the time that you wrote your article versus if you bring something more heavily scientifically that you think is gonna be endure in terms of the value for citation and other contribution, then I think you can target these to more endured uh, platform like the printed platform and that's I think the differentiated and and then you sacrifice maybe a citation by doing the case report or the COVID-19 uh, which is a very hopefully short period uh, term uh, versus um, uh, yeah, so, so you do con you know you sacrifice the potential to be cited but you get the exposure and the dissemination of the information fairly quickly and you're becoming relevant so I wonder if that's kind of summarizing also your thoughts on the era. No, no, absolutely. I, I guess that some journals have this mission somehow, no? Because of course, when you look at uh, New England circulation, uh, Jack, uh, but any journal, of course, they may uh, share this vision and say, yes, 
our mission is to uh, uh, get the updates on the, on the disease. So, of course, uh, they can do that. But when uh, you have uh, periodicals who are uh, um, issued on a monthly basis, etc., of course, uh, you cannot uh, even keep pace with the rapid dissemination of this information. So, of course, if uh, your intervention was a weekly um, issue, of course, uh, uh, I would consider uh, uh, this kind of flexibility. But because it's a monthly, uh, with sometimes be monthly uh, issue, of course, we have to concentrate on what we can uh, uh, provide the readers with the best quality, which I think is peer-reviewed science, and avoid, of course, uh, uh, publishing uh, uh, in a rush, uh, sometimes uh, potentially skipping the uh, rigorous uh, peer review uh, steps, uh, just because, of course, we want to follow the momentum and uh, we want to publish that. So there are journals that have the capacity to do that. Uh, and of course, uh, I am reading a lot of COVID papers, uh, which are also good, uh, absolutely, in uh, high uh, scientific uh, journals. At the same time, I think, uh, yes, uh, a journal like your intervention should try to uh, focus on what is intended for, which is interventional cardiology. So sometimes we forget also that uh, COVID is not uh, a topic of uh, interventional cardiology, logistics maybe, and maybe in the future we will discover more about this disease and the link with the art, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, yes, our focus in this moment is uh, science about interventional cardiology. Other journals are doing great things in informing us, but uh, uh, yes, that's uh, the beauty of having many journals, probably. No, I agree. And I think, again, it's very hard to compete with the, you know, the big journals like New England and Lancet and Jack. I mean, also from production perspective, because even if you uh, accept the paper, you need to bring it to the format that you could put it online in the format of the production. And so you need really a huge machine. And these are hefty um, editorial, not only board, but also capacities to bring things almost on a daily basis. And, and I think the intermediate and small journals, there is no chance for them to compete. So I think it's better to adhere to a long-term strategy. I, I wanted to go a little bit on something that's related and uh, what a lot of people thinking about it. So obviously, um, as everybody knows, CRT was probably the last meeting that everybody who wanted to attend could attend. And since then, uh, most of the meeting has been canceled. So in your view, what do you think, uh, at least from European meetings, and I know that we should uh, be all going to PCR in less than two weeks if everything would have been good, but when, when do you think um, we're gonna start to see uh, returning to actually face-to-face -face meeting rather than Zoom meeting, or oh. virtual meeting? Yeah, uh, so of course uh, I save uh, great memories of CRT first of all, not just because it was uh, uh, my last uh, physical meeting, but also because it was a very good edition. So thank you, Ram. Uh, I remember that when we were there, it was uh, some months ago, there was this COVID story from China, etc. but we were not really thinking of uh, what uh, would have happened in days actually. No? Um, so, um, yeah, um, it's very difficult to think in May that uh, there will be Euro PCR. So, of course, we are waiting for uh, uh, official announcement, but of course, the logic is against uh, this possibility. I would say that uh, in my place uh, where I live in Sicily, it's not even allowed now to go outside Sicily because of the lockdown measures that are there. So, I imagine that many simply cannot travel, even if the Congress is uh, potentially uh, done because uh, the university. Do, uh, uh, do not allow them to go and uh, the, uh, the government also as well. So this creates for the next months, uh, in my mind, uh, a big problem. So if I think of other congresses that are in the pipeline, I'm thinking of uh, ESC in Europe uh, as well, uh, will be in the Netherlands, so it will be in uh, uh, September, uh, end of August. So. Uh, nobody knows actually. So because uh, uh, it's not just because uh, uh, of what the ESC wants to do, but also what the Netherlands will allow uh, to do. And uh, Italy, uh, in my case, in terms of travel, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really difficult to think that this will last uh, only a few months. If I have to think of the next pipeline, I'm very doubtful, uh, to be very honest with you, of uh, uh, many confirmation of congresses, even if uh, theoretically they are still there. Of course, I have no uh, uh, information about that, and I hope that the situation will improve in order to have a great ESC meeting, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
but probably this experience with the Zoom, et cetera, will, uh, will stay somehow. So what I hope is that this time is not wasted and many uh, organizers also learn a new way to deliver education. Of course, it's not the same thing. Nothing will compare with the physical meeting, of course, we know. But at the same time, there is uh, much we can do to uh, um, give a good experience to the audience also through the web with a different language, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope this will be not uh, just something uh, that we are waiting uh, once and for all, but also something that may help uh, in the future to give access to uh, education to more people through the web, or maybe hybrid concept, uh, physical and uh, uh, web-based. You know, I concur with you. I think that the, the ACC virtual meeting actually was not that bad in terms of uh, dissemination, the importance of the information. Uh, it's almost impossible to sit um, straight three days uh, <laughs> just uh, listening in the computer. But I think it is endured material for three months, so you have time to go in and out. It's not exactly the social networking that you want, but I think it's better than no education and no dissemination of information. But I think that's uh, one of the things that uh, we would have to get used to. Um, do you think that this is going to have any impact on journals? Because we are missing the late-breaking trials for the short term. And there was some synergies in between late-breaking trials and simultaneous publication in journals. Yeah, I think uh, this really uh, depends on uh, uh, whether the, uh, the Congress is, uh, will decide to have a kind of virtual event or not. Because uh, if, uh, like uh, ACC did, uh, they will have a virtual event, I think there is no problem with the simultaneous publication uh, uh, in journals, no? because of course you need an embargo date, and then uh, you can uh, work exactly like uh, you would do with a normal uh, Congress. Of course, you do not have the uh, spectacular situation of the main arena, it's uh, definitely different. At the same time, you gain also more in terms of uh, web interactions, because I can tell you that, of course, at the ACC, it was short, it was sharp, but in the end, it was enjoyable somehow, eh? because uh, many people were connected, they were commented uh, uh, immediately through social media, through the platform of ACC. So, of course, uh, anything can be improved, but uh, it's not uh, too bad uh, in terms of uh, rapid access to late-breaking science. And I think uh, the New England, for example, published it simultaneously as well. So uh, it's not necessarily a problem in terms of access to, to science. With some organizations, uh, we, we could have the simultaneous publication uh, together with the uh, virtual presentation. So I think uh, this probably is not uh, very much affected. I think so. Yeah, and maybe a uh, last thing is really practical. So you running your editorial board meeting via Zoom right now, via WebEx? I mean, how do you handle, like, I mean, obviously you're in the south of Italy and you have uh, the editorial board spread in many countries in Europe and your uh, managing editor is in other states. So how, how practically do you run your editorial board meetings? Yes, thank you very much. So essentially, uh, the journal, of course, uh, is here in Catania, where, uh, where I stay, and we have a daily uh, board meeting. But we have also the international weekly uh, board meeting on uh, Tuesday, and this is run by uh, LifeSites, which is another uh, platform like uh, Zoom or whatever. What is interesting is that uh, for a lot of time, we run this, uh, uh, um, this meeting uh, uh, via phone, essentially, so uh, people uh, couldn't see each other. But now it's so obvious that you can use this kind of video uh, system and uh, uh, a possibility that now it was a smooth transition to a video uh, meeting that now we have on a weekly basis very effectively. So I think this is a good lesson of this situation somehow. Now people are less hesitant to use these uh, systems and in the end they maximize uh, uh, the efficiency, I would say. It's a smart working somehow. Sometimes it's uh, every wor uh, working as well because you can uh, do more things, maybe you do uh, too many things, while when we travel, we were used to do one thing per day. You know? So of course, uh, uh, this is the downside. But at the same time, uh, yeah, not traveling, having time to, uh, to reflect, to, to do your job is also an opportunity. But of course, we all uh, want uh, things to go back uh, to, the, uh, to the past, which was better. Yeah, so I think a testimonial to the enjoyable uh, platform is this interview, which I enjoyed very much to have with you over the past 30 minutes. And it just tells me that uh, uh, even once we are the post-pandemic, we probably will continue at a certain 
uh, aspect to use this new platform. Uh, we learn how to use it. We learn to love it. Uh, we see what's the pluses of that. Obviously, there are some minuses, but I think that's going to endure beyond the pandemic. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you, Davide, for uh, coming from south of Italy, sharing us uh, your thoughts on your intervention and beyond. And I also would like to wish you to grow the journal and to make it a leading journal as it uh, continue to lead in the field of interventional cardiology. And I'll be happy to continue to be a contrib contributor as a consultant. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rama. Thank you. Appreciate it.